Today we're going to continue, sort of we're journeying through Lent, we're going to continue talking about what it would have been like to follow Jesus the rabbi. I know many times when my faith has been weak, I've thought, it doesn't seem like it, it's fair. You know, if I got to be one of the 12, I would have been able to walk with Christ and see all of these miracles and experience all these great things. And, and, you know, I would have never doubted. You know, I would have trusted him. And yet you look, you see the disciples, many of them, they actually did abandon Jesus, all except the Apostle John. And what I remember is that God offers us the scripture and the story, but so often we read the scriptures in the light of sort of Western, American, or whatever country we're in. We read it sort of in our own light. And we do what's called eisegeting, where we put our own meaning into the text when it doesn't exist. One of the best things we can do is understand the culture, the language, and the way that people sort of taught in Jesus' context to really understand the scripture. And the first thing we want to remember about Jesus is that Jesus was and Jesus is a rabbi. Jewish. Our God, our, our Jesus, was and is Jewish. And he brought that lens with him uh, into his earthly ministry. If we don't understand the rabbinic life and Jewishness of Jesus, we might miss out on his message altogether. One of the first things to remember, especially about the Jewish people in the first century, was their deep, adoring love for God's word. They loved it. Torah was the center of their life. They wanted to build everything about their educational system, everything about the way that they taught, Everything about the way they lived, they wanted to base it off of Torah. So they were hungry, hungry for God's word. And there was this system built of rabbis and disciples where the rabbis would teach the disciple how to live out Torah or live out God's word in every aspect of their lives. And so Jesus, as a rabbi, one of his main goals was to teach, to fulfill and to even give an example of what it means to live God's word. To teach Torah in, in its complete and fullest way. And so one of the best things we can do is to imagine what it would have been like to sort of be there with Jesus as he was teaching and to think through God's word. Now, being a rabbi, Jesus loved parables and loved stories, and he didn't always unpack it. You know, the Jewish way of teaching is through story and metaphor. We, we don't like to do that very often in the West. When, when we hear, you know, scripture or, or Jesus say something like, God is a tower, we go, oh, God is immutable. You know, we say, oh, God is a strong rock. We go, oh, that means uh, God is invincible and perfect. We always try and parse images to make them more precise, thereby somehow ruining its beauty and its ability to drive into our heart. Jesus doesn't always parse the stories. He doesn't always unpack the beauty. He sort of wants it to rest and sit within the human heart. One of Jesus' favorite metaphors is the metaphor of plants. He loved to talk about things like trees and vines and, and uh, grains of barley and mustard plants. I mean, he was always talking about plants. And I don't know why. I mean, maybe it's because of... Maybe it's because with a plant, it grows first in invisible ways before visible ways. Maybe with a plant, a plant bears its fruit in season, not all the time. The plant needs rest. Maybe because a plant is hard to kill, especially if it's old. For whatever reason, Jesus loves to talk about the organic nature of plants and how it relates to the spiritual life. And so the passage that Hannah, good job, Hannah, very nice. Uh, the passage that Hannah read today where Jesus is sort of telling this story, you get this picture of Rabbi Jesus, and he's on a hillside, probably, uh, and, and there's, it's probably a farm. And very often the way that the farms were terraced back then, they would, instead of just sort of growing a farm on, on a normal hill, they would make it into into kind of stairs like this. They'd build these little stone walls. 
and then they would make it flat, and then plants would sort of grow like that. And then you, the farmer would, would have a flat sort of area to, to till and to plant and to use his carts and everything. And so very likely there's a, there's a farm already there and it works almost like an amphitheater because it's like on a hill. And so these steps for this farm probably work like seats for the thousands of people that want to hear Jesus speak. And so what Jesus does so that everyone can hear him is that he actually goes out on a little boat and he goes off the water about, you know, maybe 10, 20 feet or so and speaks up at the hill just like a Greek amphitheater so that the thousands of people there can hear him. And so there he is, he's talking, and he, and he talks to these people about this farmer, and he says, look, um, he says, look at this farmer. There, very likely there was a farmer right there who was just taking seeds and walking along the rows, sowing seed like this from his bag, you know, just kind of walking. He says, look, very extemporaneously. The kingdom of God is like this farmer over here who's taking seed and scattering it around. And some seed fell on the path and, and, uh, it, and it was eaten quickly by the birds and didn't take root. And, and some seed fell on the soil, but it, was, it had rock under it, so it didn't take root. So when the sun came out, it destroyed it. Other seed, it, it fell among the thorns, and so these thorns grew up and they choked it out. But some seed fell on good soil, and when it took root, it... it, it, it produced a great harvest of 30, 60, 100 fold. When they leave, after he told that parable, because he didn't explain it to anybody, he just sort of said that. His disciples said, Rabbi, we, we didn't understand when you talked about the guy throwing the seeds. What was that about? And Jesus says, it's like this. He breaks it down into four parts. I want to talk about that. The first part Jesus talks about is the seed that falls along the path. See, Jesus says the seed is the word of God. That can be Torah. That can be what God says about you. That can be how God speaks to you through the Holy Spirit. And it could even be Jesus himself. You know, the book of Jan John says that Jesus was the word made flesh. So Jesus tells these people, the seed is the word of God. And when the word of God is spoken over your, over your life, over your heart... How does your heart respond? It either responds like a path, it either responds like a stone, it either responds like soil with thorns, or it responds like good soil. And he said, the first one is this, is this path. You know, the seed it falls on the path and it, it doesn't take root. It just the birds come and they eat it up. Many of our hearts, they're like that path. The path you see in this farm, it wouldn't have been made of, uh, you know, like a Roman road. It would be just like those paths that you see when you go hiking. You, you know, you ever go for a hike or go for a walk uh, sort of out in the wilderness? Or you get these paths that they form and they're rock hard. And even though there's plants everywhere, there's sort of like these, these paths that sort of take their way. Um, like I love Peter's Canyon. I, I even went there this morning. And as you, you walk, you see that these paths have become rock hard and they become hard. I need you to hear me. Because they've been walked on. And they get walked on over and over and over. Walked on over and over until they become hard like concrete. And many of us are like that. We have become uh, hard towards faith. Many of you today, you're here with your spouse. Many of you who are, are watching on television. Your heart has become crystallized. It has become ice cold, rock hard to the word of God. God wants to say things to you like, you're my beloved, and I'm calling you, and you can be a new creation, and we respond with just a hardness, rock hard. And many of the times, we're that way because we've been walked on. Have you been walked on in your life? But I want to say to you, don't become hard to the word of God. Don't let your heart become hard to the word of God. Let it permeate your soul, let it take root, and let it bear fruit in your life. There's one way, you know, that, that, that path can still be soil, but there's one way it can be made soft. You know what it is? It has to be broken. It must be broken, and it must be rained on, and it must be softened by living water. Many of us, we need to come before God in mourning and weep the loss of our innocence Weep the loss of our dreams and expectations and give them to God and weep over them. And if we do that, our heart can become soft towards a new reality, a new future in Jesus. 
Jesus says, I will pour over you rivers of living water. And just allow yourself to be saturated in the love of God and in the love of good believers and disciples who want to help you and mentor you and love on you. Even if you find yourself hard and callous, today I want to say, break, break, so that God's word can permeate your heart. Break! Let the Lord break through your heart. Let him plant the seed inside of you so that you can have a true future, so that you can totally be filled with his life and his love. Break! That was, that was what my grandpa was good at. He was good at sopping the soil. People used to get in him all the time because he said he didn't preach the Bible enough. And he said, you know, there's some people that plant the seed. There's some people that nurture it. There's some people that harvest it. But I'm here to till the soil. He did that, and he did it well. Can I get an amen? We're thankful for that. The second group that Jesus talks about is the soil that, that falls on rock. And so imagine again that hillside with all of those steps like this and the sort of walls made with stone. What would happen is that topsoil would fall atop that wall and it would only be a half inch or an inch thick. And so it would look like good soil and, and seed would fall and it would start to take root. But the root wouldn't go very deep. And Jesus says, this is like the person who, upon hearing the word, springs forth with joy and excitement. But when the time of testing comes, because they have no rootedness, they're not able to, to press on through. And many of us, we remember that. We remember a time in which our faith, when we first heard the word of God, or we, we first heard a calling from God, we said, yes, Lord, and we responded. And, and the first few months were really great. We had lots of joy, and, and we were just devouring stuff. But something came, a trial, a difficulty, and we find that we were, we were withered, and we didn't make it through a time of testing. And many of you say you're like that today, and I just want to say, dig those roots deep. What this tells us is that the roots, the hidden things are more important than the visible things. If you have big roots and a short, what do you call it, shoot, you're okay. If you have a high shoot but little roots, you're in big trouble. Can I get an amen? amen. Roots, hidden, little things in the kingdom of God, that's what matters. Remember Ronald Rawlheiser told a story. He said he had bamboo in his backyard. And there's nothing he could do to destroy this bamboo because the root system was so strong. He said he had this huge bamboo. It was going up like 20 feet. And he cut it all back. He cut it down. And he cut down like, you know, a foot into the ground and thinking he'd killed it. And a few months later, all of a sudden, it came back even stronger, right? Any of you know how rotten bamboo is? And so you know what he did? He cut it down. He covered it in poison. He put gravel on it and then cement over it. And he said about six months later, the bamboo came shooting through the concrete. <laughs> this is what it's like. When you put your trust in God, when you allow his word to be deep, deep, deep in your soul, like way deep, nothing can stop you. No concrete, no poison, no rubble, no cutting. The word of God is stronger than all of these things. If you hear God's voice, if you trust in it, you believe that you're his beloved, you listen to his calling, nothing can cut you down. Nothing can break you. If you find yourself rooted in God, can I get an amen? amen. That's the truth, amen. The third person Jesus talks about is, is the, the seed on, on fine soil. But it, it grows with weeds. You know, that's the funniest thing about that, that passage. Is that the seed that falls among thorns is actually good soil. Isn't that interesting? Very often, those of us who are actually really good soil that receive the word, we're also really good at receiving all the other stuff we're not supposed to do. You ever feel that way? I believe that the enemy's tactic is always the same. You can see it through history. It's always in this order. Number one, he tries to cut you down. If you come to faith and you start following God's, I can, I'm a walking example. If you start to do what God calls you to do, the enemy will come after you and he will try and cut you down. If you have your roots in the word of God, you're going to make it, you're going to endure, and you're going to be okay. And you know what he's going to say? That doesn't work. Every time I attack him, it's like pruning a tree. It only makes him stronger. It only makes him flourish more. And so you know what he does then? If I can't kill him, if I can't destroy him, I'll smother him with pleasure and with busyness. It's like that all the time. If I can't get him with harm, I'll get him with wealth. Look, we live in the wealthiest country in the world. This is what Jesus says. He says, the thorns 
And the weeds that grow up, are, and he says it in this order, are the wealth and worries of this world. He puts them together. And it chokes out the word of God in your life. You know, that's the thing, is, is that this, is, this seed, it falls on good soil, and because it's good soil, weeds grow really well, just like the Word of God. And if you don't pull the weeds, the Word of God will be choked out in your life. I remember when my grandpa personally, he lived with us in Oklahoma, and he decided that this kind of dirt that was in our backyard, he was going to redeem it, he was going to make it good soil, and he was going to grow tomatoes. I mean, he was, de- he, was, he was, you know bent on this and so he decided that he was going to first thing he did was make the soil great and he wouldn't allow any organic matter to be thrown away it'd be like you have eggshells and you throw them in the sink what are you doing no let's go into the backyard you know especially if something was rotten or moldy or stunk or all that stuff in the back of the fridge that was like (laughs) money that was like he wanted that you know that was going into the dirt in the backyard to make this soil and I, I thought it was bizarre. You know, he's always taken the most rotten, gross, organic material. And he was just passionate about spreading around this dirt. And he did this for months. And pretty soon you had this black, moist, rich soil that he had essentially made. And then what happened? After the first rain? Weeds, right? It was just like weeds everywhere. Whoosh! <laughs> And so you had to keep pulling it, pull all these weeds, and that's the thing. Good soil doesn't just grow the word of God, good soil grows weeds. And many of us who receive the word of God, we also receive these weeds in our life. We find ourselves getting busy, we do all of these things that are good things, but we do too much. We find ourselves completely saturated in busyness and hurry. And so we've got our soccer camp and we've got our homeless outreach and we've got our chess club and we've got our kids stuff and our grandparents stuff and oh yeah, I've got this dinner. And we find that very quickly because we're good soil and because we're responsible and because we like to do a lot of things, our garden is covered in weeds and thorns and the word of God becomes choked out. And so because we have no time for prayer and no time for meditation, no time to really nurture and see the word of God grow in our hearts. We replace true Christian joy with entertainment. Because we don't have time to nurture true joy in our hearts, we pay money for a fake version of it. Never let entertainment or fun become a replacement for true Christian joy. Amen. Amen. If you want the word of God to grow in your heart, You have to do the hard work of pulling up the weeds out of good soil. If you let those weeds grow in your garden, the word of God will never take root. If you're super busy all the time and you're super stressed out and you're super worried, the best thing you can hope for is entertainment you can buy. You'll never have true joy in your heart. You have to do the hard work of pulling up the weeds. Can I get an amen? Amen. Sometimes the weeds are good things, but God hasn't called you to that good thing. We're supposed to do one or two or three things, not a hundred things. Amen. You know, and the thing I just want to say more more than anything is is that, you know, very we we are always like, oh, I'm this, I'm the seed on the stone, or oh, I'm the hard. The thing is, all of us have been all of these things. We've all been rock hard towards God. We've all been the ones that didn't have deep rootedness. We've all been the ones with weeds, and we've all been good soil. And that's the great thing, is that even now you're receiving the word of God. Even now the farmer walks through this field and he takes seed and he throws it out like this. Just throwing seed, just like this. He throws seed and the question is, what what will happen to the word of God when it's expressed in your life? You know, every single example is a response to what God says. So God, God's word comes to the hard path, and the hard path says God is dead. The seed comes to the, the rocks, and it says, no, I give up. It's too hard. I, I'm, this, this life is too difficult. The seed that comes to the thorn, it says entertainment and busyness is better. But the seed that falls on good soil just says one word. It says Yes. When the word of God comes to you, what will you say? See, all those other words, they're, they're ways of saying no, but the good soil, when the word of God comes, it says yes, yes. 
And so the word of God comes and it says, you are my beloved. You're not what you do. You're not what you have. You're not what people say about you. How will you respond? God just wants you to say one word. He wants you to say yes. And when God says, go for me and do my work in this way, he wants you to just hear one word and that word is yes. And when God says, obey and live my way and treat your neighbor with dignity and love and, and live a life of altruism, he just wants us to say one word, yes. And so when we study the scripture and when we pray and when we hear from God, he just wants to hear one word, yes, Lord, I will. Yes is a word of trust. And trust is a way of saying faith. He wants us to respond in faith when he speaks. And when the word of God is sown and when it's scattered amongst our hearts, we will always respond in one of these four ways. And today you have the opportunity to change and respond in a new way, to just simply say yes. Would you bow your heads with me? And so the word of God has come. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us, whether religious or not, are human and make mistakes. Many of us have found ourselves completely lost. And so now the Lord is speaking to you here in this church, friends. And the Lord is speaking to you who watch on TV. Maybe you're just flipping the channels. But God's word is coming to you. And, and, and all your life, the seed continues to be scattered. And you've been hard towards it. You've been rock hard. Will you break for once? And will you allow God's word and God's invitation to permeate your heart? And if that's you, I just want you to say, you don't even have to say it out loud. Just say it in your heart. Say yes. If that's you on TV, you're watching, just say yes. That one word will save your soul for all eternity. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to even know the Bible really well. You just have to have a little bit of faith, the faith of a mustard seed, and you'll be saved. Just trust your life to Jesus. Become his friend, and your life will be saved. And so maybe in your, you don't have to say anything out loud, but pray this with me. Father, I need you. I'm broken. I feel myself torn from you. And I pray that you'd forgive me. I trust in the cross and resurrection of Jesus. And I pray that you'd reconcile me to you. Lord, there's a small part of me that believes. Allow that one seed to grow into a great tree. Help me to learn and to know what it means to be your disciple. I say yes to you, Lord. I'll follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.